Don Don Global, Global presents, presents the DG Recruit Podcast on everything headhunting and recruitment. Achieve the life and career you envision. What's up, game changers? It's your host, Don Don, founder of Don Don Global, the headhunting and career coaching company helping you achieve the life and career you envision. In this podcast episode, we will talk about something a little bit more in depth as it relates to career coaching because. I definitely understand this wave of layoffs that we're seeing have been concerning. Now, anyone who is out and about in the real world is knowing of people or seeing people or personally impacted by layoffs. So today's podcast is really going to talk about factors to make sure you'll never be laid off. But outside of that, I definitely want to customize it also to what we're discussing mostly on this platform, this podcast, which is agency recruitment. So I think the important thing to watch out for is understanding all the factors that make a particular role more resistant to layoff activity, as well as what you can personally do to increase your odds of never being laid off. I think it's two sides of the same coin is, of course, there is a macroeconomic situation happening. And then there's also microeconomic situation happening, which is you, right? The bigger environment versus the smaller microcosm of your life. So let's break it down. These are the factors that I've discovered lead to candidate dry markets that, again, because they're candidate dry, hinges upon the first point that I want to make, which is that There are not a lot of people who can do the role. This is what is called supply and demand. Supply and demand obviously is a economic concept where if there is a shortage of something, the price of that thing then goes up. Same idea as it relates to labor forces. If there are less people capable of doing a job that is in high demand, then that will create something called a candidate tight, candidate scarce market. Conversely, if it is a role that there are tons of candidates laying around, people willing to do the role, then it becomes a client-driven market, which makes it less ideal for obviously people like you and me, agency recruiters, to make our money in. But more so for the candidate themselves, it is not a fantastic place to be. So the supply and demand, I want to say, is the first most important thing to notice. Now, If you'll further evaluate that particular concept, what happens to most agency recruiters when they find that they they no longer can work as an agency recruiter? Well, a lot of them go internal or want to go internal. I mean, the industry failing rate is like probably 80% within one month to two years is as high as four out of five people will no longer be doing our job. And because so many people are leaving our job to then go internal, what is happening is you're seeing an overflow of candidates that are willing to become HR people, human capital consultants, you know, recruiting coordinators, what have you all on the internal side. And that is why, my friends, you will see that we have had a humongous decrease in roles for that sector because they're certainly inundated with people who are trying to cram their way into that sector, as well as a high amount of layoffs in that sector. All the people who went internal these last few years, a lot of them have been let go and they're just trying to get on by somehow, some way. And they will. There are always going to be good HR, TA jobs for young people who it really screws over is the older people because there is such a thing as ageism. So let's talk about that. Ageism is another issue that inevitably will push people out of a role because they no longer culturally fit within the role due to generational differences. This is why you don't see a 70 year old person working at Meta doing recruiting for their engineering teams. This is why you also don't see a lot of 60 year old computer programmers walking around, let's say, your top unicorn startup. Because again, those businesses tend to be younger in age. I mean, the CEO themselves are probably in their anywhere from late 20s to early 40s. So culturally, it also doesn't make sense to hire someone with such a generational 
difference. And what happens a lot with older talent, they tend to cost more and be more finicky and also leading to high volumes of PR nightmares because you can't really lay off a 70-year-old. It just doesn't look good on the airwaves. So naturally, there is an element of ageism that is worth thinking about. And the way I've come to think about ageism is, well, why have I never been laid off or planning to be laid off? It's because I divested from being a worker my whole life. And yes, I have a recruiting business, but more importantly, A, I own that recruiting business. And then also on top of that, I have a bunch of other things going on. I have a bunch of other side hustles, businesses, and income streams like real estate, like training, like coaching, like content creating, right? So those are all the things that I have outside of a job because if you're 60 years old or 50 years old and all you got going for you is a job, then that is pretty dangerous because could you be thrown out of the workforce due to ageism? A hundred percent. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because the majority of you people tuning into this podcast is probably ages 20 to maybe 35. So I don't think this is something I have to really elaborate too long about, but it is something for you to think about if you want to enter HR and you're headed into your 40s and 45. You know, in that case, why wouldn't you just keep running your own agency, just keep doing your thing? right? That, I guess that's one element that is worth considering. All right. That point aside, let's talk about some other factors that make a role uh, impervious to layoffs. Here is something more theoretical. Now, I love this idea of substitutes. So for instance, instead of going out and eating at a bar and drinking at a bar, spending, you know, $120, I can also substitute that activity with a date and go watch a movie on my AMC pass, which is only $24 a month to watch an unlimited amount of movies. So if I'm going to watch my second movie with this particular date, the maximum cost that we would spend is potentially $50 to maybe just $25. Even with concessions, you end up spending about 60 bucks. So that is a substitute for the existing other option of either going out and going on vacation or doing something else, right? So a life is, our lives are a series of decision making between substitutes. Now, how does that relate to roles and how does it relate to jobs? Well, it is directly translatable because there are certain roles and jobs that certainly cannot be reproduced or substituted in any way. For instance, is there anything that can substitute a lawyer going to court on your behalf to argue a case in front of a jury? No, it is only a lawyer that can go and do that job due to regulatory control and due to legal requirements of how the court system works. So you cannot, and we have seen people try to represent themselves in an effort to cut out the middleman, the lawyer, the authority figure, and they fare terribly. We have seen that happen a lot if you watch a lot of true crime like I do. So substitutes for the role, what exists? And I think for recruiting, that's another really easy one. What kind of thing can replace me as a headhunter talking to you all day, building a relationship for two to three years, and then at that one perfect day, I hit you up and say, hey, how's your family doing? What you up to? And then you tell me, oh, Don Don, I think I might want to move jobs today. I'm glad you called. Now you can tell me, is there anything that could possibly substitute what I just described? And I have to say again, that is another fantastic reason why agency recruiting is so damn impenetrable to substitutes. Now, let's look at internal recruiting. I think there are quite a lot of substitutes for internal recruiting, namely RPO, Recruitment Professional Offsite Recruitment Process Outsourcing, whatever the hell you want to call this beast of a Frankenstein monster, that's what those businesses do. And as you can tell, I poo-poo RPOs all day long with my heart and my soul because they are the ugly, distant cousin of recruiting, yet at the same time, they want all the perks that we do, aka big money and recognition and value, and without having to do any of the work, selling to new clients, really filling racks. They're just basically scam artists in my eyes that sell the shit out of their capabilities 
capabilities and grossly under deliver. Now that is a substitute very similar to talent acquisition because that's kind of the same thing. It's like, hi, Mr. And Mrs. Client, I will be your sole provider and I'm going to get you candidates all day long. You will have my undivided attention. I'm going to recruit for every single one of your divisions. So what's the difference between an RPO and an internal acquisition team? It's the same shit. It's just different in terms of how you pay them and how you write them off on your taxes and whether or not you need to give them health benefits or not. Obviously, for RPOs, you don't need to do that. They have their own staff and they care, take care of their own people and they have to pay, you know, health insurance, whatever. So my point here is, what is the substitute for a genuine headhunter, though? None of them. None of these are actual substitutes for us. There is no substitute because we are niche. And the nicheness gives us power and control in a way that those other businesses simply cannot win. Like what can a TA person do when it comes to cyber recruiting? They can't do much because they don't spend all their time hanging out with cyber people day in and day out. So when do they know if the right person is ready and available and willing to move? They don't know. Same with the RPO, right? So while those businesses are substitutes of each other, they are certainly not a substitute for you and me. So again, we are in a good spot there. Let's talk a little bit about something relating to that topic, which is the automatability of certain professions. Now let's look at TA. TA roles sometimes can become a platform play. And here's what I mean by that. As if for certain markets, let's say hospitality recruiting, I think low end markets where it's largely gig economies that don't require a humongous level of vetting. And even if there is a decent amount of vetting, um, you can still argue the case. So in my mind, there are certain markets like nanny recruiting, like hospitality waitress recruiting. Those are things that could be done on a platform model. In fact, I believe that those are markets that I like dog walkers, for instance, that's a very easy platform play where you can just create a website and just say waitresses on demand, boom, and just get that sort of gig sorted out, right? So those, I think those platforms, those markets lend themselves to a little bit more automatability because it's less high touch, it's less high end versus let's say you're now recruiting nannies to work for Kim Kardashian. Now that is not as automatable due to the high touch premium layer. Now those services should be accordingly much more expensive so as to execute on those searches properly. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's very different if you're looking for someone to be a delivery driver, which is why you see Uber. Uber basically took over and completely um, monopolized the gig economy as it relates to specifically delivery staff or any sort of um, transportation short-term um, trips, right? So those are just something to think about. Is this automatable? And I don't really see how possibly it is automatable to do what I do. When I'm recruiting recruiters, I mean, goddamn, it takes forever to get them to trust you. So every single day I have to make content and I have to get them to like my shit. And then finally they might be behooved to make themselves known to me, right? Like, tell me, is that automatable? No, it requires ingenuity. It requires creativity. So these things are very hard to automate. Whereas I need to find a waitress. I'm willing to find, pay $25. Do I have to be increasingly creative for that? Do I have to be really marketing genius to market a waitressing job? No, because it's a relatively straightforward gig. Whereas if I'm trying to recruit a top biller to leave their $300,000 a year and to come work for one of my clients, I have to work a lot harder for that, right? That requires a lot more content production, a lot more creativity. So let's bring that into another point, which is clout. Now you might have heard me use the phrase, phrase clout. Clout means that you have fame and fame means that you have followers or a following. And the people recognize your role within the larger marketplace, which makes you less likely to be laid off. Now this works for people like you and me, who are like producers, as well as for regular ass employees. Because a company is so scared these days of PR nightmares that they will be very careful how they lay people off and who to lay off. If they're purely making a budget play and they just need to squeeze money out of the budget, which is very common, then they would likely get rid of someone who is potentially even better at doing something than you are simply because you have more of a following. 
Now, this makes sense for the company because they're like, well, we look at a person's human capital as incorporating all of their network. So if I, if I have a recruiter that has 500 contacts versus a recruiter with 50,000 LinkedIn followers, I mean, which one, if they put out a post, would bring more negativity to my company? All things being equal or slightly marginal, as in a person with a bigger following actually is 10% worse, but has 10x more followers. I will elect to keep the person with 10% worse work ethic, worse production, worse ability, but I will keep them because they have such a humongous following that kind of works its way through for me as a business, me as a company. Do you see how people are coming up with those algorithms in their head? I mean, that's how I kind of look at the world. I see everything as an algorithm and in margins, right? So again, if I'm 90% worse and I have 10x followers, then yeah, maybe that is sort of a you ought to be fired sort of situation, which then leads me to another point, which is how good are you at the chosen role? If you are really good at your job, it's likely that you actually enjoy your job, which is why you've become good at it. So that is kind of a chicken and the egg sort of situation for me. I don't meet a lot of people who are really, really good at something that they genuinely hate with their full soul. I don't really see that. I mean, do I meet people who are adequately good at a job and like, like it all right? Sure. But the people who are really excellent at something who are at the 1% of their game, uh, and I would include myself in that very much so. I love my job. I genuinely do. I really enjoy what I do, which is why I constantly get better at it and constantly maintain my role within the 1% of the industry. It's because I consistently enjoy what I do and then as a result, continue to win in that chosen field and this cycle of love kind of reproduces itself all the time. So that's something for you to consider too. Is this a role or are you in a role that you enjoy and are good at it relative to others. And obviously, the better you are at it from an exponential level, the more secure your job will forever be, which is why I have never seen a single recruitment agency in their right frame of mind fire a top producer. In fact, they will even keep a mediocre producer for hopes that the producer might one day start doing better. And that's why agency recruiting always pays the lower base salary. It's because we want to keep these people around and we're splitting the risk at the end of the day. So in our line of work particularly, I have never seen layoffs happen to top producers, nor would they ever be let go. In fact, the more you produce, the more stable your job will forever be. In other words, as a revenue generator, you have immense power at whatever the heck company or firm you work at. Last two points I want to talk about is one is, are you in a growth industry and not a dying industry? For instance, there is a huge push away from fossil fuels. So if you today start getting your oil and gas degree, you might as well today go and get your electric car degree or oh, I don't even know what fields those are. Don't ask me. Um, I'm like electrical engineering. I don't freaking know. But you get my point is that don't go after the dying industries. So for instance, if you were graduating at the turn of the 20th century, you wouldn't go and become a horse farmer and start creating tons of horse carriages because the future is all about cars. So that's the same idea as it relates to today. In fact, you should not be figuring out how do I work more with oil engines? You should absolutely be figuring out how do I work out more with electric engines? And as it relates to recruiting, because I know that none of us are about to go become an engineer, as it relates to recruiting, make sure you're recruiting in a space that is not dying. If you are recruiting in a space that is dying, then you are only giving yourself more work to do, more headache, more misery, and eventually unemployment for yourself. We do not want to work in dying industries. Agency recruiting, the industry that I recruit for, is a growing industry. And it's a relatively stagnant industry, but at the same time growing uh, because it's super, super niche and un unsexy. And that's why this is a good industry for me to go in because there is always growth for top recruitment professionals. Now, is there a lot of growth in electrical uh, vehicles? Absolutely. In solar? Absolutely. In particular levels of maybe waste management, maybe even water, like water resources? Absolutely. There are a lot of company countries that are suffering from lack of water. You know, the sciences, right? STEM. STEM is still going to be key and queen and king 
uh, moving forward because it is a growth industry always due to one last point, which is barriers to entry. Now, barriers to entry, I don't want to make it a be all end all because let's be real. You and I are both sufferers of barriers to entry or should I say lack thereof. In the agency recruitment world, there is no barrier to entry. So tons of people enter this field, which is why our dropout rate is 80% within one month to two years. It's because too many people get in this industry who have no idea what they're getting into and therefore they fail out of, t- out of it relatively soon. So because we are in a low barrier to entry but high failure rate industry, it is still very much candidate dry. Now let's talk about high barriers to entry. Now those are your typically regulated roles such as SEC related, finance related roles. Now of course those are highly regulated industries and they will require certain types of credentialing. Other types of roles that require significant credentialing are related to healthcare because you are dealing with people and their lives. So all of these industries have high barriers to entry. Now that automatically, obviously I talked about legal already, so that falls into this category because there are so many high degrees of separation keeping people out of this industry. Naturally, those industries lead to more insulated and more increased stability. Insulation from layoffs, increased stability or potential of stability. But at the end of the day, I want to leave everything on a positive note, which is no matter what type of industry you're in, whether it's highly automatable, whether it's dying, (laughs) whether it's not exciting, whether it's heavily populated by other people, whether it has really low or high barriers to entry, whatever the case may be, you on an individual level can still do quite a bit of damage. If you happen to love your job, are good at it, have positive energy, and are likable to boot, you likely will not suffer from layoffs as much as your peers. So you could be in a slightly less good job. And uh, I will, again, pick on talent acquisition, TA, HR, internal recruiting, human resources, any sort of those roles. I would plot right into this category. It's decently automatable. It's not exciting. It's not a growth industry. It's a relatively boring support function. It's not very hard to do. Um, There isn't any real barrier to entry. There's a very limited amount of roles in this field. A company only needs so many HR people. It's not what I would call a truly essential role, right? Like you don't need an HR person to design code that makes Uber Eats run. Uh, They they're not as important. What's more important is actually the people who are coding those systems. Now, HR people obviously are not as essential as those people. But if you are likable, if you are young within a certain age, if you just happen to have all of these factors going for you, you will still keep your job. Now, don't, you know, don't mind me. Don't mind everything I'm saying. There are people that will still have their role. But the problem is long term, is it going to be an issue? And that is why I talked about having an exit plan, having a plan B. If you are in a kind of not so great situation based on all these factors I talked about, then you, of course, need to think clearly for yourself, what can you do to protect yourself further? And that is why, my friends, I will always leave it at control your spending, invest smartly, because you never know which day something awful is going to happen to you in your life or those people around you that will require you to live a much more diligent life. Because if there's anything that I've learned in my years becoming an entrepreneur, going through business failure, going through business success, going through career failure, career success, um, investment failure, investment success. I can tell you that you always need your plan B, your assets, everything pumping in your favor. I hope this was helpful. Uh, I definitely want to hear your feedback. So please do reach out to me if you have any feedback. I have a training coming up on Friday. Sign up on my website, dondonzoo.com, Friday, December 9th, 2022 at this time. So make sure if you haven't yet, sign up for that event on my uh, mailing list, dondonzoo.com. And then also, if you have not already, please, for the love of God and all that is almighty, please leave your girl a review. 
a testimonial on the DG Recruit podcast that is spreading the word of how good this thing actually is. There are hundreds of you tuning in every episode, and yet I don't have more than 100 reviews. And this podcast been around since 2017. So please, it's time for the holidays. Show me some love. Get on there. Write me a nice testimonial telling people how good this podcast actually is. And I'll see you on the sales training. I hope DG Recruit is helping you understand the realities, challenges, and opportunities when it comes to headhunting and recruitment. Whether you're already a top biller or an aspiring headhunter, I'd love to get to know you. Sign up at DonnaGlobal.com to stay in touch on all aspects of career coaching and headhunting. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll see you there. Thanks for tuning in to DG Recruit. This has been a production of Donna Global.